Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to Alpha Boot Camp, episode number two. I'm Bridger, and today we're going to talk about the use of instancing in Star Citizen. Remember, this is a companion to the Tales of Citizens podcast. We're going to give you some solid information here, but all the discussion and debate about these features will take place on Tales of Citizens episode number two. So check the show notes or the description for links to that episode. First off, it's important to understand that Star Citizen uses one online persistent universe. Unlike World of Warcraft, you will not have to coordinate with your friends to find out which server you're on. Everybody's in the same large server. Secondly, you're not going to be seeing thousands of players in the same large battle. Most people estimate that Star Citizen's singular battles are probably going to get upwards of 100 versus 100. Probably nothing too much higher than that, simply due to the technical limitations and the fidelity of the battle in Star Citizen as compared to things like EVE Online. It's important to understand that there are two main pieces to Star Citizen. There's the instances where you can actually walk around or fly around in 3D space and the Galaxy server. The Galaxy server contains all of the information about what's going on in the world. So when you're interacting with a panel in your ship that's saying the buy and sell values of some item or you're looking up jobs when you're in a bar, you're talking to the Galaxy server. That's the persistent element of the game where everything revolves around. The instances are basically shards of 3D space that are created as long as there is at least one player in that area of the universe. So if there's nobody orbiting uh, Centauri 3 and you then pull into uh, and launch off into the orbit around Centauri 3, an instance will be created just for you. If there was already somebody orbiting around uh, Centauri 3, you would have joined the instance that's already available. And if that instance is full, a second instance would be created. So these instances are dynamically created and then destroyed if there's nobody there, because it doesn't make sense to use server resources when there's nobody actually physically in the space. The Galaxy server, on the other hand, often acts like your transportation to get from one instance to the next. So if you're on a planet and you uh, talk to the Galaxy server, try to figure out what job you want, you go over to a bulletin board, you see that there's a bounty on somebody's head and you get some information and you start to blast off into space and now you're in orbit, you're in an orbital instance and you decide, okay, I need to get to, to the Terra system. So I need to take this jump, then that jump, and then that jump. You set up a plot of course, you hit your autopilot, and then the game is certainly going to hand you over to the Galaxy server, which is going to take you along that autopilot course. You don't need to be in a 3D instance while you're following that, but if anything happens, if you run into pirates, or if you meet up with a friend, or something else happens to you, you'll be dropped into an instance. If you pull out of autopilot manually, you'll be dropped into an instance in space, and you might have to fight or flee or... Uh, uh, talk your way out of something. So that's how the Galaxy server will work. It'll work for as a transportation between all of these dynamically created and destroyed instances, whether they're on planets or up in space. What's important to remember is that Chris Roberts and the rest of the team at Cloud Imperium is going to attempt to make the transition between all of these instances and the handoffs between the Galaxy server and the instances as seamless as possible. You're hopefully not even going to notice it happening. So when and how does the server choose to populate your instances? It turns out that there are four major factors. Your friends list, your PvP slider setting, your skill level, and other relevant factors, including persons of interest. Chris Roberts used an example where somebody is on a planet and they're tasked with a mission to follow a bounty hunter back to their base. So they tag the person as a person of interest, meaning whenever they go up into space and they have a choice of multiple instances, the server will try to slot them into the same exact instance as the person they're following. How this all comes together is that when you enter an orbit or a battle instance, the server has reserved slots in every single instance of that area, specifically for the friends and enemies of a given player within that instance. This will mean that 
if you are in an orbit around Terra, for instance, and you're trying to meet up with some friends, but your instance is full, they will still be able to enter that instance when they show up because there are slots reserved specifically for the friends of anybody already in the instance. Now the galaxy server determines when or if you get pulled into a battle instance while you're traveling from place to place. When you go from a planet's orbit to a specific waypoint, which could be anything from a hulk of uh, a destroyed ship to an asteroid field to a moon to a jump point. You're gonna be going from one of those places to another, and while you're traveling, you're in the autopilot mode, which means you're not really in an instance per se. Nobody else can see you, and you can't really see anybody else, and then when you get to the other side, you'll appear within an instance. However, the Galaxy server will determine whether you may or may not drop out of autopilot because there are pirates waiting in ambush along your route, for example. And once you do get into one of those battle instances, the only way to leave is to either destroy the hostiles or put some distance between them and you. This implies that you'll be able to flag yourself as looking to do some piracy so that NPCs and players that are traveling through your area have a chance to be stopped and caught by you. Now, once you get into one of these battles and you're fighting for your life against pirates or you're the pirates trying to take some well-earned treasure from a, from a merchant vessel, your friends can actually warp to the fight and join you if they're in the system. Or if they arrive in the system before the fight is over, they can also warp in and get to you. One other way that friends will be able to help is they can actually drop into your multi-person ship as one of the NPC crew. So for example, if you're flying around in a constellation with a couple of NPCs and uh, you tell your buddy, hey, I've got some people on my six, he can sort of log into the game as a member of your crew and take the place of one of your NPCs, jump on a turret and start blasting. Now it's time to talk about the infamous PVP slider. So, here are the facts. You will have a slider which allows you to choose whether you'd prefer to have more interactions with other players or more interactions with computer-controlled pilots. Now, you could choose to put it all the way over towards players, all the way over towards the computer players, or somewhere in between if you'd like a mixture of both. But there are some severe limitations. Even if you put your PvP slider all the way over to PvE, player versus environment, or player versus AI, as it might be called, uh, even if you put it all the way over there, even in the most secure sectors in the game, there is still a chance that you'll wind up fighting other players, okay? Some have estimated it's going to be about a 10% chance. No matter how you set your slider, the minimum you're going to have is a 10% chance at a player encounter rather than a computer encounter. Okay, in addition, the security level of the sector that you're in will determine how much that slider influences the outcome. So if you are in a very high security sector, very safe area where there's a lot of police to help if there's a player encounter, then that slider is going to have a lot of control. You're going to be able to say, I want mostly PVE encounters, and you're going to get mostly PVE encounters. But the lower the security sector, the further you get from civilized space, the less and less that slider will have any effect on whether or not you have a player encounter rather than a computer encounter. In fact, when you get to the furthest reaches where the most lawless space is, the slider will basically have no effect at all. You're either going to get some player encounters or you're going to get some computer encounters, and it, the, that place in space, you're just not going to have control over whether it's going to be PvP or PvE. Another piece of information that we know is that ranking and reputation rewards will be lower for PvE encounters. So you will be encouraged to fight other players because you know that the rewards are going to be higher. In addition, Chris Roberts has said that he's designing the game to try and prevent you from being able to easily tell whether you're fighting a player or a computer. It's not gonna be as simple as, oh, the ones with the green tags are players and the ones with the blue tags are NPCs. There are gonna be NPCs flying around doing all exactly the same things that players are doing. They're gonna be doing missions, they're gonna be on bounty hunting, they're gonna be doing all kinds of things. In fact, if a job is posted for a long time and a player doesn't take it, an NPC will take that job. So 
the game is going to try to blur that line as much as possible. So you may not even know if you're fighting a player or a non-player character. That's all for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for more information on this topic, you can check out the show notes in the description. They're also posted on talesofcitizens.com that lists all of the articles that we used in coming up with this video. Uh, in addition, check out podcast episode number two for Tales of Citizens, where we specifically delve deeply for an hour about this specific topic and ask all of the deep questions and get into the details and speculation about exactly how all of this is going to work, the problem that they're going to face and how they might overcome them. You can also, of course, subscribe to the audio feed or the YouTube channel if you really enjoyed this and you want to hear more. And stay tuned for the next episode, which is all about the physics of Star Citizen. I'm Bridger, signing off. Have a good one, guys.